Welcome to everybody to this uh, Robotics 2 lecture. Today we will consider the problem of controlling the robot motion when the robot motion is driven by the error defined in the Cartesian space, namely at the end effector level of the robot. So far uh, we have seen uh, a number of control laws, both for regulation and for trajectory tracking in the free space, where the error driving the feedback action uh, was mainly defined at the joint level. Now, with this extension today, we will get closer to the point of interest of robot operation, namely the end effector level. We will uh, see uh, some selected results about regulation and trajectory tracking, uh, and while we leave uh, the generalization to other possible control law to uh, your own um, study. So, uh, we will start with the first type of controller, which is intended for regulation of the desired Cartesian pose uh, at the end effector level. Uh, we can consider a PD plus type of control, namely including already gravity in the picture from the beginning and gravity may be fully cancelled by nonlinear feedback or compensated at the desired pose. Uh, but the, the main aspect of the controller that we will see is that the error will be defined in terms of the Cartesian pose. Uh, so we will consider the dynamics in the following form. Um, we neglect for the time being any dissipative term, so on the right hand side there will be only the uh, control torque pro produced by the motor, so namely the one that we, for which we should design our controller, uh, plus uh, the direct and the differential kinematics. P uh, in general represents uh, a combination of position and orientation of the end effector, uh, while uh, the Jacobian in the second expression will be the analytic Jacobian. So the dimension of the joint space in general is n, while the Cartesian uh, dimension is in general uh, a variable m, which may be equal to 6 if we are considering the full position and uh, a minimal representation of orientation for uh, like Euler angles or uh, roll picture angles for the end effector. In general, n may be equal to m or larger, in which case we may have some form of redundancy of the robot with respect to the Cartesian task. Indeed, m may be also smaller if we are dealing with a special structure like a planar structure for a uh, robotic uh, device. So our goal is the asymptotic stabilization of the end effector pose, namely we would like to bring the end effector at the desired pose PD and with zero velocity. Now please note that uh, we are specifying uh, a mixed target, so position and orientation is in the Cartesian space while zero velocity is specified at the joint level. Indeed, this will always imply that the end effector desired velocity is also zero. Now, uh, if n is equal to m, then uh, zero velocity at the joint level occurs if and only if the end effector has zero velocity up to uh, kinematic singularity of the structure. We already kn know this uh, situation. When we have redundancy, so when n is larger than m, then, uh, in addition, when we specify an end effector pose, this does not uniquely associate a complete robot state because there are n minus m joint coordinates in general that are missing in this specification. So we have an infinity of possibility of realizing the same pose uh, with different uh, robot configuration. So, uh, with this in mind, let's consider the following uh, Cartesian regulation law. The first term, uh, uh, in the first term, we have we generate a Cartesian error, so PD minus P. We react to this with a positive definite matrix gain KP, 
uh, which is symmetric and in general is chosen, can be chosen as diagonal. And then we uh, transform this um, reaction force or generalized force into a joint torque by pre-multiplying it by the Jacobian transpose. The second term is a, a damping action, so it's proportional to the joint velocity through a positive definite gain KD, again symmetric and typically diagonal. Uh, and finally, we cancel gravity everywhere, so we have a nonlinear feedback action considered in this case. So you can notice that uh, this control law is kind of a uh, mixed term because there is an error in the Cartesian space at the position level. But the second and third term are directly joint torque, uh, so defined in the joint space. For this control law, we have the following theorem. So under the action of this controller, the robot states will asymptotically converge, so stabilize, in general to a set which we label as A, which is the set of state where the joint velocity is zero, and the set of configuration uh, in which the uh, difference between the desired pose and the actual pose realized, so by the, through the direct kinematics, multiplied by the control gain Kp, lies in the null space of the Jacobian transpose. Indeed, this set of states uh, includes also uh, the desired one, so namely zero velocity and configuration such that we realize the desired and effective pose. The reason of this uh, weaker result in general will be apparent from the proof. So the proof is based on uh, a Lyapunov analysis or Lyapunov type analysis. So we define a Cartesian error of the pose, so E of P, PD minus P, and we associate a Lyapunov-like candidate function. Uh, this uh, function uh, consists of the kinetic energy of the robot, exactly like in the case of a PD plus gravity cancellation in the joint space, and with a quadratic term uh, which represents uh, a spring-like potential energy which is uh, introduced by the control, uh, which is a quadratic function in a positive definite quadratic function in the uh, pose error. Note that uh, this function is zero uh, if and only if there is zero velocity and we realize the desired pose. And this is in fact a subset of the set A defined in the um, uh, thesis of the theorem. So the set of uh, state which zeroes the uh, Lyapunov function is in fact contained in the set A, where we will converge asymptotically. Now, with this in mind, let's uh, look at the time derivative of the candidate Lyapunov function. The first step is uh, the usual one. So, from the kinetic energy, we get uh, two terms. Um, one contains the derivative of the velocity, so m q double dot, and one contains the derivative of the um, inertia matrix m dot. And um, the factor one half in the first term is gone because we have two equal contribution when we do the derivation. Uh, the second term produces instead uh, the, the um, term minus ap transpose kp times p dot, simply because uh, p desired is constant, so the derivative, derivative, time derivative of EP of the pose error is just minus p dot. Now, uh, we replace the dynamic model, so in instead of mq double dot, we write uh, u minus all the terms brought to the right-hand side, so dropping dependencies, as you see in this expression for compactness, u minus s Q dot, where S is a factorization of the uh, Coriolis and centrifugal term, minus G. So these are the terms coming from MQ double dot, uh, and the rest is remains the same. 
Now we use the property uh, of conservation of uh, energy, so that the fact that the m dot minus 2s uh, vanishes when set in a quadratic form with the joint velocity q dot outside, and this is true for any factorization of the correlation centrifugal term. Um, so these two terms cancels, and now we can replace the expression of the control law. So to u, we replace j transpose kp uh, pose error minus kd q dot plus g. And uh, we have a cancellation of g uh, from the model and from the control law. And also we have a cancellation of the first and last terms because one, uh, these are two scalar, one is the transpose of the other and they have the opposite sign. So we are left, like in the uh, joint space, PD plus gravity cancellation situation, with uh, uh, the time derivative of the Lyapunov function, which is minus it's a quadratic form in the velocity, so minus q dot transpose kd q dot, which is less or equal than zero. And again, we have that b dot is equal to zero if and only if q dot is equal to zero. So we proceed uh, analyzing the closed loop equation and invoking possibly uh, LaSalle theorem. So when q dot is equal to zero, the, the model on the left hand side, uh, the velocity term vanish, so we are left with m q double dot plus g. On the right hand side, the derivative uh, term vanishes as well, so we are left with j3, j transpose kp ep plus gravity. So we can isolate acceleration in the following form. Uh, q double dot is equal to m to the minus 1, j transpose kp ep. Now, uh, without any specific assumption, uh, we see that acceleration will be zero if and only if the pose error amplified by the uh, gain matrix will lie in the null space of J transpose. And by applying the Sal theorem, uh, the thesis of our theorem follows. Now, uh, we have a corollary. Now, suppose that we start for a uh, with a given initial state, uh, q of time 0, q dot of time 0, typically we start from rest, so q dot is equal to 0. Now, if during motion uh, the robot en encounters no singularity of the Jacobian transpose, so in general, configuration where the rank of J transpose is less than m, which is less or equal than n, when m is equal to n, this means that uh, the Jacobian transpose, as well as the Jacobian, are never singular as matrix, then we have asymptotic stabilization to a single state, if m is equal to n, or a set of states, if m is less than n, such that uh, the pose error is zero and the velocity at the destination is zero as well. So exactly what we wanted to achieve. So we cannot predict a priori if we will encounter singularity or not, but essentially this is a situation where the robot may be trapped hmm, when uh, the error lies exactly in the null space of Jacobian transpose. So we may cross singularity and still uh, have motion continuous because the uh, pose error multiplied by the control gain is not in the null space of the Jacobian transpose, if we don't cross any singularity, then this uh, will never happen, and we will end up exactly with a pose error equal to zero. So we see at the dynamic level that this situation is pretty much similar to what we encounter when dealing with uh, the gradient method for solving inverse kinematics, where, again, J transpose was playing the role. Uh, that was just a numerical algorithm. In this case, we are exploiting uh, the dynamics of the system and the transformation of force command from the Cartesian space to the joint space, which are um, related by the Jacobian transpose. Indeed, uh, this 
uh, notes should be obvious to all of you right now. Now there's a, uh, a possible variant for regulation. So we could define the PD control law uh, in an all Cartesian way and still do gravity cancellation in the joint space. So the following uh, controller is uh, uh, as before, but now we are damping the Cartesian velocity P dot with this different gain in the KD, but still positive, definite, and symmetric, and typically diagonal. And then we are converting the sum of the proportional and derivative term uh, by the Jacobian transpose in order to generate a torque, so from a generalized Cartesian force to a torque, while gravity cancellation occurs always in the joint space. Now, it's uh, interesting to give a, a mechanical interpretation, like we often do. The first control law, so the one where the damping was introduced by control in the joint space, is equivalent to uh, the physical system on the left-hand side where we have a, a spring of stiffness Kp uh, through which we anchor the end effector posed to the desired uh, PD value while we damp motion, so we damp velocity at the joint level with Kds. Uh, on the right hand side, instead, we have this second old Cartesian law where there is a spring and a damper um, with a stiffness Kp and uh, damping coefficient Kd respectively, which anchor the end effector to the desired pose. So during a transient, uh, indeed, we will uh, uh, be attracted by this force uh, to the desired uh, pose Pd, and we will damp while the end effector is moving energy. So we will dissipate energy. Uh, in the first case, uh, same story, that will be the end effector will be attracted by this uh, Cartesian spring to the desired pose, but we will dissipate energy at the joint level. And I've chosen here uh, a 3R planar case, uh, with or without gravity, if gravity is present, it is being cancelled by the last term in the controllers, uh, if it's not present, then this will be only a PD uh, or uh, in the Cartesian space. So uh, I chosen uh, a redundant arm for a planar task. So n is equal to 3 and m would be equal to 2 in this case, just the position, to show that the difference between the two possible variants for regulation. In the first case, even if we reach the final destination for the end effector, we will continue to damp any residual joint velocity uh, in the joint space. Uh, in the second case, instead, we will have the possibility of having self-motion, which is undamped as long as uh, this does not move the end effector. In fact, only moving the end effector will dissipate energy with the second control law. This is why I would prefer, in general, the first uh, regulator as opposed to this second one which is more uh, all Cartesian defined so in principle uh, it fits better to the classification that we have given ourselves but in fact it may have problems in the, pre in the presence of redundancy in both cases uh, the error uh, in position is always driven by the Cartesian post error so this uh, uh, mechanical interpretation is uh, again confirming that the control laws are transforming some virtual elastic force in the first case or virtual viscoelastic force in the second case, force and torque in general, if we uh, expand the situation from position to the general pose, uh, and those forces are acting on the end effector and the Jacobian transpose is used to convert them in control torque, so we have a nice interpretation in this case. But we don't use, in a sense, when we're de dealing uh, torque control, 
uh, inverse or pseudo inverse of the Jacobian. We just use the transpose of the Jacobian because we are converting dynamically forces, either of the elastic type or of the viscoelastic type in the two um, presented regulator. Now, uh, let's move to the case of trajectory tracking. And we will consider, in particular, a design based on feedback linearization. So again, the robot is represented by the usual model, and we define some output for the system, uh, and to this output we will, be, uh, we will later assign some uh, desired trajectory. So this is the full pose or only the position, and in this uh, context we assume now that the number of Cartesian quantities that we are setting under control is equal to the dimension of the state space, so that the Jacobian associated to the direct kinematics P equal F of Q will be a square analytic Jacobian. Now, uh, to design a feedback linearization controller, uh, and then to use this for solving, addressing and solving the trajectory tracking problem in the Cartesian space, uh, the solution is not obvious in the first place. So we will use a, a technique which is uh, called inversion control of our system. Uh, we have some inputs, the number of uh, the torque U uh, and number of N, and we have some outputs, so the post variable P in the same number. And when, if we would like to inverse uh, this input-output relation, the algorithm works as follows. We should take the outputs and differentiate them as many times as needed until some input will appear. Now, this operation is done in general uh, output component by output component. So we take the first component of the output, y1, and we differentiate it as many times at least at, uh, until at least one of the input torque appears. Uh, in the present case, we can do this for all outputs altogether. Now, when this happens, so when the input torques appear at a certain order, differential order of the output, then we verify if we can solve for the input from this uh, high order uh, differential equation. And then, by solving, we cancel all nonlinearities. So let's look uh, at this general algorithm applied to our uh, problem at hand. So we start with y equal f of q. We take the first derivative y dot, and we have the Jacobian times q dot. Still, in both in y and y dot, there is no input u appearing. However, when we uh, reach the second differential order, so y double dot, which is equal to j q double dot plus j dot q dot, we are familiar with this derivation. Now, we replace to q double dot the model, uh, the expression coming from the model. And in this expression, we have the appearance of the input torques u. So we stop the uh, algorithm at this stage, and we have a relation y double dot equal j multiplied by m to the minus 1, so the inertia, the inverse of the inertia of, of the robot inertia matrix, times u plus other nonlinear terms. Now, uh, can we solve for u here? Well, first of all, we have uniform relative degree uh, for all outputs, so we have differentiated all output the same number of times. This is general for nonlinear system. Uh, may not be the case, but in this case it is true, and we have this theorem. So, we are considering a non-redundant robot for our uh, problem at hand, so with m equal to n, then it is possible to use feedback linearization. So, uh, apply a non-linear control law that exactly linearizes and decouples the dynamic behavior at the Cartesian level, if, the, not only if, the matrix pre-multiplying uh, the input at the second differential order of the output, namely j m to the minus 1, is non-singular. Being the inertia matrix always non-singular, this happens if and only if j, which is here a square matrix, 
is non singular so if and only if the determinant of j is different from zero so in all configuration that we may encounter where this happens so out of singularities then we can achieve feedback linearization in the Cartesian level and the control law is in fact uh, the following one no? so if uh, you define you cancel all nonlinearities and then you invert the matrix which is also termed the decoupling matrix uh, jm to the minus one uh, in terms of a new input a so the control law is the following one u equal m of q j of minus one of q a plus the coriolis and centrifugal term the gravity terms which are being cancelled and in addition you need to cancel some uh, torque m times some acceleration, that is an acceleration, which is related, related to the curvature of the Jacobian, to the fact that j dot is different from zero. So this uh, control law is of a general form uh, of state feedback, nonlinear state feedback. There's an alpha term as a function of the full state q and q dot, plus uh, a non-singular matrix beta function, in this case only of the configuration q, times the new input a. And if we apply this to our system, in particular, to the second derivative of the output, which is the Cartesian acceleration, uh, this substitution provides uh, the linear and decoupled behavior. So P double dot is equal to A. But pay attention, uh, this linearization and decoupling is achieved at the Cartesian level, so in the right coordinate. So if we started with the q and q dot coordinates, uh, the dynamics in the joint space is not linear. The dynamics which is linear is the one displayed by the Cartesian coordinates, so in the state p and p dot. In fact, p double dot equal a uh, represent uh, a parallel of input-output uh, double integrators in the Cartesian space. What happens if we look at the system in the joint space? Well, uh, we just apply the control law on the right hand side to the model. Now I've dropped all the de dependencies. And you see that we cancel with our control law, so with the term C and G on the right hand side, the Coriolis and centrifugal and gravity term on the left hand side. We have a, an inertia matrix pre multiplying all the remaining terms, so we can. Uh, without loss of generality, pre-multiplied by the inverse of the inertia matrix and we get equivalent closed loop equation. So we do this operation and we end up with the following uh, behavior. So if we look at the acceleration in the joint space, not in the Cartesian space, they are still a function of Q and Q dot, so of uh, the state of the system in a nonlinear way, as well as function of the new input A, but this equation are highly nonlinear and also coupled. So every component of A, of the new input A, affect more component of the joint acceleration. Whereas if we look at the system in the linearizing coordinates, each component of A affect one and only one acceleration component of P double dot. So it is important to realize that a feedback linearization works uh, in the right coordinates, when we express the system in the right coordinates. Now we uh, uh, have a nice physical interpretation of what's going on. I show here on the left hand side uh, a generic articulated robot. This is a 3R uh, elbow type manipulator with the uh, base joint Q1, the uh, shoulder joint Q2 and the elbow joint Q3 and the associated uh, applied torque. Now, if we move around this robot uh, uncontrolled or subject to any control action which is not a Cartesian feedback linearization controller like the one we have just designed, then the inertia of this system will change with the configuration. And uh, if we move uh, the robot in different Cartesian or joint direction, uh, this inertia will be variable according to the configuration and the actual direction. Now, uh, 
if moreover we apply a force no, if, assume that we are in a static situation so that the velocity is zero and we are applying some torque which balances gravity so the system is an, in an equilibrium now suppose that we apply a control force at the end effect in some direction it's a pure force in this case because the, the robot has uh, three joints so n is equal to three and we are would like to consider a square case so the m uh, dimensional and the factor space is three dimensional as as well so we are applying the force with component fx fy fz if we have had a six jointed robot we could consider also the static situation of equilibrium and the application of a force and a moment but let's stick with this simple situation at this stage now if we apply this force then the end effector will accelerate we'll have uh, uh, an acceleration p double dot which in general uh, is not in the direction of the applied force uh, it will not uh, it can be proved that it cannot uh, go into a direction which forms an angle which is larger than 90 degrees with the direction of the applied force but in general will uh, accelerate in a different direction and this different direction will change if we apply the same force in intensity and uh, direction uh, in a different equilibrium configuration so if we change the configuration of the arm so this is uh, nothing else than the uh, realization that the dynamics of the robot is highly nonlinear and coupled. Now what happens if we apply our feedback linearization control law? The system behavior will be that of a unitary mass placed at the end of factor uh, and the, the behavior of this mass will be uniform and constant in any direction and in any configuration of the robot, which is now transformed to this Cartesian mass. In fact, the equation of this mass uh, in the closed loop are simply m times a with m equal to 1, uh, sorry, m times uh, p double dot, so with m equal 1, p double dot equal a, exactly what we have written before. So if we apply a force in any direction along the main axis or along a different axis to this mass this mass will accelerate in the same direction of the applied force and this will hold true uh, both in intensity and in direction no matter which is the configuration at which we are placing uh, the robot and therefore no matter which is the position within the workspace but outside singularities where we are placing the equivalent unitary mass indeed uh, modifying the um, resulting mass to a non-unitary value so with m different from one is very simply achieved by uh, scaling uh, the a factor in the previous control law i leave this as a simple exercise to do uh, by the way this will be uh, also important uh, sorry. this will also be important when we will uh, interact with the environment and assign a specified apparent inertia at the end of it through feedback linearization okay so uh, this nice uh, Cartesian control law non-linear Cartesian control law can be derived uh, working in a different terms in fact uh, we could um, uh, rewrite the feedback linearization control in terms of a pure uh, control force stored F expressed in Cartesian term so I'm writing again the full expression now let's move this torque in the assumption that uh, m is equal to n uh, let's rewrite this joint torque into a generalized Cartesian force we do this by pre-multiplying it by j to the minus transpose 
and what we get. On the left hand side we get uh, a Cartesian generalized force, while on the right hand side we have each term pre-multiplied by j to the minus transpose. If we reorganize this term as uh, shown in the slide, so we have the first term multiplying the new input a as j minus transpose m j to the minus 1, then we have a number of uh, control terms. We have the gravity term expressed in Cartesian at the Cartesian level, so multiplied by j to the minus transpose. And we have the Cartesian equivalent Coriolis and centrifugal terms, which are those coming from the joint space uh, Coriolis and centrifugal terms, plus the additional uh, quadratic term in the velocity coming from the uh, curvature of the Jacobian of the transformation. Uh, so each of this single term has a Cartesian interpretation. So we have on the left hand side a control force F which is equal to the Cartesian inertia M of P, so J minus transpose M J to the minus 1. We have seen this transformation when we have uh, looked at the how the dynamic model of uh, our robot transformed under a transformation of coordinate, in particular here the transformation is moving from the joint space variable to the Cartesian space variable. And then we have the Coriolis and centrifugal terms at the Cartesian level and the gravity terms at the Cartesian level. So in fact, the uh, Cartesian controller, feedback in rising controller that we have found in the previous inversion algorithm is nothing else than what we would have found if we started with the Cartesian model of the system, so M of P in terms of the Cartesian variable P, so the inertia matrix at the Cartesian level times the acceleration, plus the gravity and Coriolis and centrifugal term, all expressed in terms of Cartesian quantity. So if this was the model that we started from, then feedback linearization is obvious, as obvious as in the joint space, namely we apply a force which cancels CP and GP, and modulated by MP applies a new acceleration. So this is exactly what we have designed in the joint space, but we could have started from the Cartesian space and realize the same uh, decoupled and linearized, exactly linearized behavior between the acceleration at the Cartesian level and the new input A, so P double D, P double dot equal to A. So this is just a way of reinterpreting exactly the same uh, control law. Now, uh, I mentioned that we introduced feedback linearization for solving or for addressing trajectory tracking problems. So at this stage, once we have decoupled the linearized uh, the behavior at the Cartesian level, we have a desired Cartesian trajectory PD of T, uh, which possess first and second derivatives. So we design AI, the single component of uh, the new input, by stabilizing the trajectory error. So feed forward the, the desired acceleration in that direction, uh, and then closing uh, a proportional term to the position error with the gain kp i and the proportional term to the velocity error p dot desired of e minus p dot of e multiplied by the gain kdi. In this sense, it makes uh, while in general we can use kd and kp as symmetric and positive definite, there is no or there is little sense in uh, using matrices which are non-diagonal because we would risk to uh, couple again the system on the linear side of the problem. Uh, the same, second comment is what happens if we have redundancy? Indeed, the control law that we have defined previously uh, in the control law, we may replace the inverse of the Jacobian uh, with the pseudo-inverse. Uh, the result that we get is that we obtain linearization and input-output decoupling only, so between new commands AI and acceleration at the joint level, but 
we don't linearize fully the whole state dynamics. In fact, there's an internal dynamics being left of dimension n minus m. And of course, we may do some extra activity. So we can design, complete the design with extra uh, joint torque contribution. We would typically stabilize this uh, internal dynamics, which is remains still nonlinear. Uh, another remark, which is worth uh, to be done, is that uh, while uh, closing the loop, the Cartesian loop uh, of the position error and velocity error, these quantities are implicitly defined uh, through their direct kinematics, so we can measure uh, joint position and velocity, the velocity are typically obtained by numerical differentiation of high resolution encoders, so we measure in the joint space, we compute through the direct and differential kinematics P and P dot, and we build up the errors and then uh, define the uh, input command AI. Or we could also measure directly quantities in the Cartesian space. So for instance, we can use uh, a vision system, so camera, which overlooks the operation of the end effector, measure the actual pose, uh, maybe with a stereo system, so we have a position and also some information about the orientation, or the complete information about the orientation. And from there on, by uh, doing numerical differentiation, we could uh, build uh, the control law which uses both the joint space measurement for evaluating uh, dynamic terms, so G of Q, C of Q, Q dot, and the inertia matrix, but Cartesian measurement for evaluating the uh, error part in the linear side, on the linear side of the problem. Indeed, if we are using cameras, the frame rate at which we can update commands is typically slower at the at the rate at which we acquire information from an encoder in the joint space, and this would hamper the behavior uh, of the uh, linear stabilizer on the Cartesian side. So this, uh, the trade-off between using mixed uh, measurement or fully uh, of measurement only in the joint space uh, should be compared to the fact that by using cameras, we know exactly where the end effector is, and we get rid of any uh, kinematic errors that may be introduced. On the other side, uh, working with a measurement in the joint space and direct and differential kinematics achieves uh, a faster uh, implementation of the nonlinear control. Uh, indeed. Uh, having chosen a uh, feedback linear regression uh, approach, not only we achieve exponential stabilization, uh, sorry, asymptotic stabilization of the trajectory error, but this stabilization is in fact exponential because it's achieved at the level of linear dynamics. So every asymptotically convergent behavior is in fact an exponentially convergent behavior. And the transient behavior is shaped through the proper uh, choice of the eigenvalues of this uh, linear behavior, which is made by choosing uh, the values of the diagonal gains of Kp and Kd. So nothing new under the sun. We are only uh, exploiting the uh, linearity of the achieved dynamics, close loop dynamics. Now, when, uh, in case we have a constant task, so a relegation task, we can still apply feedback linearization and exactly like in the previous, uh, in the joint space case, there are no special simplification. You see that the only difference is inside the square bracket in this expression where the acceleration, the acceleration P double dot vanishes and the error on the uh, Cartesian velocity, so KD times pd dot minus p dot, uh, just uh, the pd dot is gone, so it remains only minus kd p dot, which can be computed through the Jacobian as jq times q dot. 
all the rest remains exactly the same. Indeed, uh, this is a regulation controller, which is clearly more complex to be implemented than the regulation control laws that we have just seen uh, at the beginning of this lecture. The PD plus gravity cancellation, or uh, both in its uh, mixed form or its, in its fully Cartesian form. What is the difference? Is that those controller guarantees asymptotic convergence to the desired uh, pose, constant pose PD if singularities are not encountered, while this guarantees exponential stabilities of the transient error, so a better transient performance if singularities are not encountered. By this, I would uh, conclude uh, this uh, treatment with two examples, as or three pro probably, examples of control laws, two for regulation, one for trajectory tracking. But uh, some conclusion should be drawn. First of all, uh, I've chosen only two of the many control laws that we have seen, because any other control law in the joint space uh, may be translated uh, I would say with relative ease uh, to the Cartesian space, to handling of Cartesian pose error. In particular, regulation with constant gravity compensation uh, or adaptive regulation, this is something that we have uh, not treated in video, but it's present in the last few slides of the adaptive uh, control uh, for trajectory tracking case. Uh, same for robust control, uh, all this part has been skipped this year, uh, but you can find slides in the website as well. And similarly, adaptive control can be uh, extended to the trajectory tracking case when the error is in fact a modified error at the end effector level. So what are the main issues in fact? Uh, no matter which controller, uh, either uh, the Jacobian transpose or the Jacobian inverse, or in certain cases when we have redundancy, the Jacobian pseudo inverse appears, so we have to deal with kinematic singularities. And this is kind of uh, uh, reminiscent of what happens when we were dealing with kinematic control in the Robotics 1 course, where moving from the joint space to the Cartesian space. Uh, had to face the singularities of the Jacobi. So these singularities are inherited even when we are dealing with dynamics and with torque commands rather than velocity or acceleration commands at the kinematic level. So in the same way as we did uh, in the kinematic control case, even for dynamic control, both for regulation or for trajectory taking, we have to deal with kinematic singularity and we can introduce singularity robustness enhancement uh, to our controller in much the same way as we did at the kinematic level. The second issue related to Cartesian control is the presence of redundancy. As I mentioned before, uh, in these cases, apart from using pseudo-inverse in place of uh, in, uh, standard inverse of the Jacobian, uh, we need to add some extra torque, which is in the null space of our dynamic mapping, so which will not affect what we are doing at the end effect level, but which will stabilize the extra degrees of freedom, uh, in particular the n minus m joint variables if you pursue a joint decomposition approach. Now you can only stabilize this behavior, you cannot in general bring the system to a desired uh, internal conf full configuration in the redundant case without perturbing the behavior of the end effect. So stabilization and not asymptotic stabilization is our main target. So you want to keep motion limited at the joint space even if you are not able to uh, or to stop the motion but you're not able in general to bring the, end of, to, to bring the robot configuration to a desired uh, um, value. If you want to do this, you have to design directly uh, a controller in the joint space, not a controller at the Cartesian level. And with this, uh, we stop, we conclude this part 
the next lecture will be devoted to uh, the next stage of our control classification, namely moving from free space to contact with the environment. Thank you for listening.